Sanibonani, Dumelang, Kuenant, Molueni, Eitada. Happy Freedom Day to the citizens and the people of our great nation. South Africa, today we reflect on this very historic day on the 27th of April in 1994. We recall that day and I certainly have incredible memories of this day. I remember my own parents going to cast their first democratic votes. How a father and mother who had been systematically excluded in the, pro, in, the, in, in the program of apartheid, in the policy of apartheid, that now today could stand as free citizens, could take up their agency as proud South Africans. This was a day that liberated the excluded, but also liberated the oppressor. It was a day of the birth of a new nation, an affirmation of the incredible leadership of President Nelson Mandela that indeed when others had written off this nation and said this country could never triumph, that ultimately bloodshed would be the order of the day, today was a reminder that the ballot box was much more powerful than the bullet. It began a day where we could say indeed it feels good to be a South African. It feels good to be an African. That no longer would we be the skunk to the rest of the world, but indeed we could be welcome to the League of Nations, as President Mandela said later in his inauguration speech. We began a journey, but our journey was a culmination of many efforts, a history that we have gone through as a nation. And I think to be able to appreciate Freedom Day and perhaps some of the challenges we face today, it becomes important that we reflect deeply on where we've come from. Our nation is a cycle of nationalisms. And by nationalisms, I want to be able to give a definition where one race finds a way to oppress another. Our history is deep and it is painful. The most recent beginning, obviously, with the more British colonialism that sought ultimately to oppress natives in a different way, succeeded by Africana nationalism and then now African nationalism. All of these types of nationalisms have got different connotations, but ultimately achieve similar outcomes. It is the favoring of one race at often the expense of another. And therefore, I want to look at perhaps what nationalism is. Today, I'm not going to focus on nationalism as a sense of us, all of us, but I'll focus on nationalism as in fact a grievance, a social and a political movement that is driven by a deep sense of grievance where population groups become aggrieved when they feel a strong sense of exclusion of enjoying political, social, and economic benefits in any given society. That's the society that we have inherited. Africana nationalism, British colonialism, have all been cycles that have brought us to a point now where we've inherited the nation that we have. And therefore the significance of Freedom Day is a significance that says to us that our nation could triumph over these as much as when we look at the future of our country, we do not wait simply for another form of nationalism, but we must point to a direction upon which citizens can thrive and a new sense of, of us can be built as a country. Freedom Day must indeed affirm the liberties of our country, must be able to point citizens towards how we build a new form of us, a new identity, where citizens can thrive and we can build a South Africa for all, upon which when we say one South Africa, that regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of the circumstances of your birth, you can participate in our economy. So when we reflect on the two nationalisms that are before us, Africana nationalism and African nationalism, let's understand the impact that it's brought. When we look at Africana nationalism, it brought a number of things. It brought the isolation of many black South Africans as a policy of apartheid. It created in many ways and maintained cheap labor through a form of oppression. The greatest, I believe, of these was a form of education and health facilities that were left primarily for the self-interest of a few. It meant that resources were only available for a few. It limited industrialization in certain areas at the expense of another. And I really believe when we look at Freedom Day today, 
one of the legacies that we have to attend to is the legacy of miseducation for the majority of people in this country. That miseducation simply said, as Farvut once said, to say that in fact, in his mind, the apartheid government could not give an education to black Africans that would set them up for expectations that could not be met in the system. Indeed, this to me has been one of the most profound evils that have been bequeathed out of apartheid. It meant that for generations to come, a legacy of apartheid would mean that generation after generation, miseducation would reign and therefore, for the majority of the citizens in this country, could not fully participate in an economy. 1994 was a triumph over this system of exclusion. It meant that legislatively, we could undo apartheid. We could undo that system of exclusion. But it also left this gaping pain, this need for us to reform our economy, this need for us to be able to take an assault to the effects of apartheid and to build truly a nation that ultimately a system where all could triumph. It ushered in African nationalism. And in many ways, African nationalization, African nationalism introduced a sense within it of democratization of South Africa. It gave the triumphant struggle that has been waged over decades of one man, one vote, where each person could be able to choose their government, regardless of where they come from. And it began a journey. It began a start where ultimately we could see some progress, some inclusion. We could build one centralized home affairs where all citizens could be treated as equal. It was the beginning of a hopeful time where, in fact, as the promise was made that we could build a better life for all, it meant that all, regardless of the color of their skin. It created a welfare state where even still today the majority or many of the citizens in our nation still depend on some form of grant system. But if we're willing to be honest, whilst we've seen some industrialization, while we've seen some economic progress, while this nation has been able to triumph in certain areas regardless of the obstacles that are before it, we can't deny the fact that our nation is still two nations. Our education results still remain largely unchanged. We're seeing more and more that in fact the majority of schools in this country are incapable of being able to produce young South Africans who are able to compete with anybody. Whilst access to education has improved, it still has left too many with an education that cannot allow them to compete in the world. It's also, as we've been progressing and reflecting on this Freedom Day, we can see that the elites have been able to take capture of the state. They've been able to build a form of elite governance where the issues of the elite are the ones that are at the central part of discussion. We're building one elite and in fact introducing a new system where there are those who are on the inside or those who are included, who can participate in the economy, but many are excluded. Many are left out. Many still today are living below the upper poverty line. And when we look at the society that now we're living in, we must realize that too many citizens are left out and too many are excluded. And now we have to understand that the biggest war we have to wage on this Freedom Day is a war against poverty. Fellow South Africans, it cannot be said that today, as many celebrate Freedom Day, many are hungry. As Chanua Achebe said, a hungry person can never claim freedom. And therefore, today, our freedom is being, un is being limited on the basis of the hunger of our people. We are living in a phase now where as we look at COVID and the lockdown that has been put on the table, many people are looking around and saying, we didn't realize what is going on. But in truth, all COVID has done is like when you look at your house, it's removed the roof and asked us to look inside. And when we look inside, we've been stripped naked to the realization of the poverty of too many of our citizens. This is South Africa. South Africa is where 55% of our citizens live below 1,138 or the upper poverty line. 
90% of our people live on less than 7,313. In fact, it's only 2% of our people that earn above 19,000 rand. So we must understand that in the main, our country suffers from income inequality. Too many of our people are food insecure, unable to live, and are hungry. When we talk about a new economy of the future, the, uh, the fight we must wage, the struggle we must wage, is the fact that we live in these two different South Africas. We live in a South Africa where in the main, the face of poverty still remains largely female and largely black. Many people live in rural communities, face the effects of hunger. And hunger is systematic. It delivers a child who arrives at school hungry and unable to learn. And often you find that in communities, as a result of this, it puts stress in the home where many have to leave home to go find opportunities of work, where our young kids are now living without any supervision. It puts stress in the home, and it means that for too many of our families, poverty is the struggle that they wage day in, day out. It's difficult, and I know, having family members and different people, how difficult it is to not be able to find work. How painful it is when you spend your days just wondering where your next meal is going to come from. We live in a country where when you think about this, the class, the classes in our nation, the most simplistic view would be to say we have an upper class, a middle class. And actually, I think South Africa is a question of five classes. We have so many who are in the few in the professional space. We have a big cohort of about 30% of our citizens who are blue collar workers. But in the main, over 50% of our people are the underclass. They depend on remittances, welfare, and they depend on just food grants that I get given by other South Africans. So, so this is an indicator of the fact that we do live in these two South Africans, where some enjoy the benefits of freedom and others are pretty much left out. Income inequality in our country is something that if we don't soon begin to address it, is creating a society that is unstable. So when something like COVID-19 and lockdowns occur, it would feel like in one community, if you go to the suburbs, lockdown instructions are working. But when you go to poor communities, how do you lock yourself? How, how do you stay in lockdown when you live in a shack and there are many citizens who live with you? How do you remain in lockdown when hunger forces you to say, I've got to go find food. This is, this is South Africa. And on this Freedom Day, we must reflect on the fact that too many of our people are left out. When we build one South Africa, we must take a hard look at the realities of the majority of the citizens in this country. We have a challenge of asset inequality. Too many do not have any form of ownership, whether that be in shareholding or property. They live in a country where for them, their rights are undermined. They are uncertain as to what they will bequeath to future generations. And if we're going to address economic inclusion, we have to ultimately attend to the question of what does justice look like and what does property ownership and share ownership look like. We have to break down the metaphorical divide that sits in South Africa where some have and others have not, where too many, are in, too, too many are excluded and only a few are included. Freedom Day must give us a new resolve as citizens to say all of us, black, white, Indian and colored, all of us rich and poor must begin to attend to the question of this inequality both on income and asset in South Africa, particularly for poor citizens.
particularly for those who are hungry. And as many in this time have taken the opportunity to go put food in communities, more must be done. Post-COVID, we need to think harder about what policies we put on the table to be able to reform our nation, to be able to say, let's build a country that can, accord, that can perform better economically. When we look at what the policies that have been taken in the last uh, 26 years of democracy, we realize that some of them have been poor, have delivered an economic situation that we sit in today where too many people are unemployed. When you look at South Africa's GDP in comparison to that of nations that at in 1994 in similar spaces, South Korea, as an example, have outstripped South Africa. Where our GDP in comparison to theirs, ours has lagged lower and South Korea has surpassed us. This is an indicator of the fact that whilst other nations have taken from a similar period and taken policies that have helped them grow so that more citizens have included, our recent history is an indicator of a country that simply has taken economic policy that has left too many citizens out. If we're going to change and have much better participation of citizens within the economy, we need to be very clear about the fact that we need to reform what we do about capital inflows, what we do about in investments that come into this country, foreign direct investment and domestic investments, so that we can begin to ensure that our GDP growth is such that more and more citizens can participate in our economy. We also, in a similar period of time, have built a bloated administration. Too many people work for the state, yet the productivity of the state has not been one that has been able to match its own outputs. So whilst we introduce fiscal constraints, three items remain. is the fact that we have a bloated administration, we have welfare, and we have skyrocketing debt, where more the majority of the money that is spent in South Africa is not to investment to new products or new programs or new infrastructure, it's not to investment in new businesses. It's often just to, main, to in, in the main, to maintain those three items, the debt servicing costs, ensuring that actually the civil service becomes bigger and larger, and we are incapable of being able to meet other needs. It is time that we reform our economy. For if we don't, we're heading towards a situation where in this country, too many citizens and the grievance of the citizens will mean that they are left out of the project of South Africa. It will mean that on this Freedom Day, we must begin to bring a different future. I refuse to accept that in years and in generations to come, we'll be having similar conversations. This is time that we look at our kids. Perhaps maybe COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to reset, to start afresh, to say, how do we begin to build change? How do we build one South Africa? How do we ensure everybody participates? How do we ensure that actually the next phase of our democracy is one when we realize that no longer can it be said that others can have health care and others can't, others can have an education and others can't, others can participate in the economies and others can't. We need change and we need a new beginning. We need to draft and craft a different future. So when we look at freedom and Freedom Day, let's begin to understand those values. We can proudly claim that we have a constitution that protects all rights, but we must never surrender that constitutional oversight that has been given to us. Let's make sure all laws work for everybody, regardless of where you come from. Let's ensure that we uphold legislative and democratic practices with a parliamentary oversight that ensures that no one is able to ever abuse power or take away the rights of citizens. I have been disturbed when I see in poor communities how sometimes police and various uh, sections of the defense force are able to infect, terrorize, get into communities, and in fact violate the rights of poor citizens. This cannot be. Our freedoms were hard fought by too many, and we ought to ensure that constitutional and democratic oversight is upheld. So, I want to propose a number of reformations, in fact, in this period. We need political reformation. We should never advance a space. If we're going to build a South Africa for all, one South Africa, we need a movement. We need a movement of all citizens, regardless of race. It cannot be said that we build a political formation that represents a race. Because when you do that, you end up with mobilization born out of race. You simply say this party is for this race. 
that political party is for that race. We must build one South Africa, a movement of all citizens, the citizens that have been excluded, the 17 million South Africans who don't participate in democracy and the 13 million who don't vote. This must be an opportunity for them to be able to mobilize at a grassroots level so that they can participate in the economy. No longer shall it be that our parliament becomes a voice only for the elite and our issues that we discuss are only for elite citizens, but actually that poor citizens can participate and have a voice in our parliamentary processes, that all citizens are represented. And to do that, we need a reformed political system. We need a system that works for all. We need to ensure that we reform our politics, that no longer it be a, 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 a war from one race to another, but actually about policy, ideas and ideals that represent all citizens. This is the new struggle. This is the new wage. So at first, we must reform our politics. Further on, we must reform our economy. We must ensure that we begin to deal with this profound question of asset transfer. It, more and more citizens must be able to own. And to this regard, I want to propose that in the reformation of even state-owned enterprises, that actually citizens must be able to get shareholding in this space. That we can give ordinary citizens a chance to participate in the economy. This is not, this is a legislative requirement that can no longer be delayed. We need to ensure that actually more citizens are able to own property. It's about the delivery of title so that more and more generations of people are able to participate and be able to own property in this country. We need to reform our education. And this is a subject I'm deeply passionate about. It can never be said that people will, depending on where they live or where they've grown up, their education be poor. We need partnerships. We need to build schools of the future where technology is the driver. We need principals who are not loyal to the union, but principals who lead in their schools. And so when we talk about Freedom Day, that for poor citizens, they can get an education that skills them for the future. Our education needs reform so that our kids can participate and compete with anybody. This is the change that we desperately need. And it requires that there, there are community involvement. It can, businesses, I want to urge business South Africans to say, you need to participate in helping us reform our education. Furthermore, we need entrepreneurial support. We need to be able to put a jobs and justice fund that is able to ensure that entrepreneurs can participate in our economy, that are able to get funding for economic growth. If we achieve this, we are then able to ensure that more and more people are able to start their businesses, are able to, in fact, start micro-enterprise and support in communities. This is where jobs are going to come from. And if we help small businesses thrive, we can ensure that ultimately more and more citizens participate and that there must be a hope. Our economy needs reform. Lastly, we need to change the way we lead. I'm tired of leaders who are stealing money. I'm tired of those in communities who are stealing food parcels from people. This is poor leadership. We must hold people to account. Africa's legacy is where the corrupt have been able to capture the state at the expense of poor citizens. If po corruption is an assault and an insult to the poor, we must make sure that we eradicate corrupt leaders so that ultimately all resources are designed for the benefit of all citizens. Fellow South Africans, we have made progress in our democracy. But the sooner we realize that on this Freedom Day, our only challenge is to build a partnership, a partnership across Africa that makes sure that we can deliver for poor. This is our struggle here on Freedom Day. If freedom is going to reign, no longer shall it be said that people must remain poor. We must work with our neighbors in Africa so that ultimately we build a fund that ensures that we can trade amongst ourselves so that more and more citizens in Africa can participate in our economy. My fellow South Africans, this is a moment. When we set out to build one South Africa movement, we did so because we want to fight for the excluded so that we build one South Africa. It can only be one South Africa if all of us participate in the economy, have an education that empowers us for the future, and that all of us can enjoy the benefits of freedom equally. I want to invite you to be part of the change in South Africa, to build one South Africa for all in a nation where ultimately we can stand up and say, 
for freedom to reign, all of us must participate. I wish you well on this Freedom Day. Let us begin a new struggle, a, str a struggle for freedom for all, a freedom upon which all can participate, a freedom at until that one day, men and women, regardless of where they've grown up or where they come from, can live together and prosper together. That is the mission of One South Africa. I want to invite you to be a part of a movement for the future. Because if we continue to just simply look backwards and forget that we have a future to contest for, where all citizens can prosper together, South Africa will be a nation that is able to, 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 to offer hope to the rest of the continent. And if we get this right, if we use this crisis for the reformation of our nation, we can indeed build a South Africa for all. I thank you and God bless you.